Welcome back to the Play Second Podcast. Today we have a special guest, Ali Gardner, one of the greatest women's climbers currently. She won the British Hill Climb Championships, uh, also won the last year European Hill Climb Championships. And uh, she recently destroyed Montez on record, which previously was owned by Anime Van Luten. Oh, thanks very much for having me. I don't know about that though. <laughs> yes, he will discuss that because we, uh, I and Naichka are calculating watts and analyzing climbing performances and your performances are one of the greatest in women's cycling history, despite that you are not a pro cyclist. And yeah, your <laughs> watts are impressive. And a week ago you destroyed the Van Luten Zonklan record. Yeah, that was, yeah, I got back from that Italy trip yesterday. Uh, so yeah, basically spent a week just going riding hard up hills and yeah, Zonklan was a good way to finish the trip. Uh, for the Zonkalan record I got 5.27 watts per kilogram for 60 kilogram standard which is for 45 kilogram which is maybe your range of 5.51 is what I get and this was like a f one minute faster than Anamik Van Vluten in the Jure Dali which was also one of her best efforts so yeah it was a really really high level of effort uh, this record. Thank you. Yeah I think Zonkalan's uh, quite a good one in terms of like watts per kilogram because it's so steep and yeah you can just like go full gas the entire time uh, yeah my favorite kind of climb yeah the, on those climbs you usually see the best watts per kilogram like, long and steep also the angleroo they're always they're, like good performances on there and zonkalan is also like one of those climbs i remember chris room had one of his best performances on there so yeah uh, usually high watts per kilogram on on such a climb talking about watts per kilo there should be offers from teams maybe maybe even war tour because your climbing performances are insane uh not not too much <laughs> like i've had a couple uh but yeah i guess they don't teams don't just care about climbing as they shouldn't because there's a lot more to racing than just that uh i just i've never really considered like road racing professionally as a career uh, i used to road race like a few years ago i stopped in 2021 i think um and yeah, as a career, it's quite, you know, it's like high risk. And from on the woman's side, there's in terms of pay and everything, it's not necessarily, you know, a stable career. Um, and I really just love like pushing myself uh, up climbs. And there's a lot, like I said before, road racing is a lot more than just that. Um, it's not just about like how fit you are, which is the side of it I like. Uh, so yeah, I sort of road race for a bit kind of, didn't really enjoy it. Uh, I raced in Europe a little bit. And then during, I think it was during COVID, um, obviously there wasn't racing going on. I got much fitter and yeah, just started climbing more and more. And yeah, that's just what I enjoyed doing. Uh, although I do wish that it would kind of grow as a discipline in its own right, like with European champs last year, because it'd be nice to have like some sort of competitive outlet for it rather than, yeah, just riding mountains. But I think women's cycling in the last years has improved greatly because of the Tour de France. Also, salaries are getting close to 1 million and some riders are earning a lot of money and even the minimum salaries are raising. Right now, it's uh, actually possible to live as a women's pro cyclist and earn only from that. It's heading in a great direction. Uh, although, yeah, it's great if you're like one of the top riders, I guess, but to get to that point, would definitely require you know a lot of commitment um and there's no guarantee that you'll make it you know and yeah even at any level it's like a, an injury or something could like put your whole career on hold it's not particularly sustainable and yeah i mean it, that's just my opinion because <laughs> i've always yeah maybe if i considered it when i was younger as yeah i don't know i'm quite happy to continue like having a job and just riding up hills. Although, yes. yeah, I do get jealous when I see them racing up Alpe d'Huez. It'd be nice to do that. I think this year the Alpe d'Huez stage would have been perfect in Tour de France for you because before that there was a Col du Glandon, very hard and steep climb, and then it finished with Alpe d'Huez. I would have loved to just 
jump in that stage. Maybe Nike can mention how much faster you were than the Tour de France riders or Nobel Duez, you, because you are much faster than the me Volring. Remember, it was two to three minutes. I don't have the exact time here, but yeah, it was very fast. Obviously, they rode a big stage before. It was like one of the hardest women's stages we have ever seen with the Col du Glandor full gas before. But yeah, it was just funny to see that they, in the end, couldn't climb even close to your time in the end. Oh, yeah. So they did have to be blown over four, so... <laughs> yeah. And maybe your situation is also a bit, like, similar to uh, Sarah Giganta, I would say, because she's also, like, one of the best fresh climbers in the world and maybe struggles with the other aspects of road cycling. We talked about this before as well in the Tour de France because she lost, I think, four minutes on the descent from the Glandon to the Alpe d'Huez and then climbed still as one of the fastest, the final climb, so yeah. Yeah. That's what you said also, that uh, the watts are not everything uh, to yeah, race. Yeah, exactly. like... But even with that, she finished 17 GC of Tour de France. Another stage, she was riding behind the peloton by like 50 meters. It's possible without any, without peloton skills to perform quite well in GC. Yeah, that's true. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. But let's say there's a team offer. How much would you want to earn to become a professional cyclist? And consider their deal oh i don't know it's yeah like i said i've never really like considered i can't like get into the mindset of actually thinking of it as like a career um but i mean having a non-cycling job is kind of hard too so <laughs> maybe i'll change my mind <laughs> we can also talk about your bike because you're using a rim brake uh, factor bike which is interesting like the o2 yeah i love it <laughs> um it's quite a light frame but uh, yeah, I just really enjoy riding it, and I don't, like, do any insane descent, so for the moment, rim brakes are, yeah, they do what they need to do, and, yeah, like, it's good for, you know, not just climbing, but just all riding in general, so, yeah, really happy with it. Yeah, there were some questions when I posted about your performance on uh, the Zonkla on Twitter, if it's, like, uh, UCL legal, is it above 6.8 kilograms? Oh, or is oh it... yeah, yeah, I weighed it oh. after Zonkla. My Zonkla one, it was 7.2. Um, All right, so... That's because I had some uh, slightly heavier wheels, because I wanted to do other riding, like, not not just optimize, like, a super light setup. Um, so, yeah, yeah it's... It's kind of comparable to the pros bikes, at least. Uh, and you don't have like a four kilogram bike, which might be even, you could get some somehow. <laughs> but so <laughs> it's like a comparable bike, let's say. I would even say the rim brakes are probably the better better choice still for climbing uh, because like even in the world to peloton, we have many cases now where the bikes aren't the uh, minimum weight. So rim brakes are still probably the optimal choice and also the wheel changes are faster so yeah 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 true. at least for a climbing stage i would still uh, think the rim brakes are maybe the better choice also you destroyed the everesting record that three years ago you did it uh, everesting in eight hours and three minutes and you were by 50 minutes faster than emma Pulley's record time which is quite impressive and before that you also broke the record Thank you. Yeah, so I did my first Everest was 2021. Um, I think, I don't even remember what time I went, but I think it was like eight and a half hours. Um, yeah, so that was when I was like still kind of road racing just before I stopped. Um, and then, yeah, the following year, I wanted to beat my own time, um, which was when I did the eight hours, three minutes. Um, yeah, obviously during COVID, it was like a pretty popular thing to do so that was when I like got it in my head that I wanted to give it a try um and yeah that definitely kind of encouraged me to like focus on climbing uh when I got that but that was definitely like just the hardest thing I've done compared to anything so it's kind of like reframed suffering <laughs> like when I'm like doing an effort or something I'm like this isn't as hard as everything uh but yeah I don't know how I had the motivation to do that because I actually tried to do another one last year um, and yeah, I couldn't do it. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I remember it was a big thing in the COVID lockdown. Like, yeah, that was when the, it like, blew up. Also in the men's Everesting record, I think there was a retired Albert Contador and then Lachlan Morton who did it. Like, it was a yeah. like, big, like, big challenge, let's say, in, the, in that time. And then when racing came back, everyone kind of forgot about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
just to show how impressive is your record, Phil Gaiman in men's category in 2020 was only by 11 minutes faster than you. If you did it maybe in this year where you are stronger, you could have beaten Gaiman's 2020 averaging time. I can't, it's something I wouldn't say I'd, I kind of want to do it again one day, but I need the mental motivation for that, I think. So, it's, yeah. It's a yeah, long it seems, time to be going seems like one of the hardest, hardest challenges, to be honest. Yeah. And like fueling and stuff is yeah, a tricky thing to stay on top of. But I was basically trying to like eat solid foods almost every repeat. So, I was basically just like constantly eating small amounts of mainly like cereal bars like energy bars and then yeah gels later on um yeah just constant eating <laughs> but in terms of actual grams i'm not sure it was a lot it should be a lot because the climb i think you've picked must have been over 15 percent gradient it was, it was like 17 percent which uh -huh. makes it pretty hard to eat as well because you're like hungry. yeah over. uh yeah i did I did an attempt like the week before I successfully did it and I got like five hours in and just completely blew up. So that's a good reminder to uh, stay on top of it because if you like just go through a period where you refuse to eat, it will catch up to you. Uh, yeah. Also talking about the climbing, you won the European Championships of Climbing last year, which didn't happen this year and there weren't much information about that and that happened in Switzerland. Maybe you can share some information about this race. Yeah, that was a pretty crazy experience because, um, yeah, I found out about it super last minute. Uh, so I definitely wasn't super prepared for it. Um, my friend and my dad, we drove over from the UK like the day before. Um, so it wasn't like the optimal prep going into it. And then like I was, yeah, like you said, there wasn't much information about it, so the field wasn't huge, and we didn't really know what to expect. Um, but it was up uh, Gothard Pass, so it's like a reasonably long climb. I uh, thought it would kind of suit me, decided to just go for it. Um, but yeah, in terms of like my setup and everything, looking back on it, I was definitely, I don't know what I was doing. Like, I had quite a heavy bike, and I was wearing like pretty baggy kit and stuff, so um wasn't super happy with my ride, but uh, luckily it was yeah I was really happy when I found out the result and it was yeah pretty crazy experience real yeah. shame that it's not happening again because um, yeah to have like a hill climb discipline would be pretty cool and like you know you could get pros racing amateurs uh, kind of give us an opportunity to see how we do against them Talking about the pros, Anna Kiesenkofer, Tokyo Olympic champion, finished 2 minutes and 16 seconds behind you. Fourth place, there was a Belgian rider, Lotte Glass. She's right now, I think, riding for Arkea, and she was 2 minutes and 28 seconds slower. This is the reason why are you saying maybe you should uh, ride in the World Tour, or at least have a chance there. But seeing your watts per kilo, Maybe only with the fresh legs, Demi Wallering is better than you currently. Yeah, I mean, we can compare, like, it's hard, you can't really compare it to the normal stages, but maybe a better comparison is like a time trial, uh, which even there, the best pros, like Annemiek van Vluten, pushed in the uh, Tour de Swiss time trial 5.47 watts per kilogram, 30 minutes uh, for standardized to 60 kilograms. It's maybe like at the same level as you like the what's he pushed and up west maybe so yeah even in those fresh efforts uh, the your qm efforts kind of hold up against the pros and uh, also like you can compare it to another time trial they did was in i think 2019 or 2018 the uh time trial in the Giro d'italia and there Anamik van Vluten did 5.07 for 42 minutes so also that is kind of in the range where it would be comparable to your best queen of the mountain effort. So yeah, with fresh legs, there might not be many riders that can beat you up a climb. Oh, that's, yeah, it's kind of crazy for me to like imagine. <laughs> but, yeah. 
at least you have a potential to win the Tour de France maybe someday and yeah not many riders can do that and if there are extremely hard mountain stage with, which would suit you I think it would be perfect yeah it is great to see that the races are actually taking on more mountains now as well um yeah hopefully it continues to continue yeah incorporate more climbing not that I'm biased but yeah <laughs> Which climbing performances are your favorite one or the best one from yours that you have done? Um, I think Alpe d'Huez is a pretty one one I'm proud of because I've I have ridden Alpe d'Huez a few times over the years. Um, it was like the first big QM I ever got, so yeah, I always remember that. Um, I think yeah, and Zonklin, I was pretty happy with. Uh, yeah, I actually. Um, did Zong Clan twice on that trip because I loved it so much. <laughs> um, yeah. But in terms of, sorry. Uh, no, no, I just uh, because I think you broke the didn't break the record the first time and then the second time you broke it. Yeah. But it was yeah, still... so I did it the first time. I did Stelvio it was like the first day of the trip, um, which was a lot harder than anticipated. <laughs> uh, the weather got like super bad towards the top. So it turned into a pretty big struggle just to finish it. Uh, and then, yeah, because the weather in the mountains was all over the place. So I was trying to cram in as much as possible. Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to uh, get to Zonklan before the weather got too bad because it was like snowing later in the week. Uh, so I went there the next day and, yeah, just had a terrible ride of it. And I'd been really looking forward to it because on paper it was like a steep, long climb. Um, sort of high on the bucket list and I just kind of started too hard overheated uh and it was an okay ride but I knew that like if I I had the ability to hopefully be able to get the QM not that it means anything but just for kind of personal satisfaction uh so I managed to yeah go back towards the end of the trip which was after a few days of hard riding but temperatures were better and yeah just really enjoyed it a lot more because I knew what to expect uh yeah and so that one was kind of felt even better afterwards I think yeah I was pretty tired by the end of that because I was trying to make the most of the trip and kind of like do a mountain every day uh so I think I did Mont uh, Grappa the day before Song Clan uh but somebody keeps flagging that on Strava which is yeah yeah I saw it was flagged bad. but yeah it was kind of weird because it wasn't that great. <laughs> I understand people because in men's cycling, no one is close to Tali Pogacar or Jonas Swingard, and even uh, best amateur climbers like Ed Loverak isn't even close to those climbing uh, performances and level. In men's cycling, there's Ali Gardner, who is uh, really close to Demi Wolverine with fresh legs. Yeah, I mean, there's also what uh, she mentioned, and we also talked about this before, that like the financial incentive maybe isn't as high as in men's cycle. Like, if you're a like, talented uh, men's cyclist, you can maybe, like, if you finish top five in a Grand Tour, you will earn a million plus easily for many years. So the uh, incentive is not there for women cycling yet. So there maybe, like, there are many women cyclists who are way stronger or have way higher potential than the current World Tour riders. Uh, yeah, I think there's quite not. a big like divide between in the peloton as well. Like in even in the uh, Tour de France, you'll have some riders there who are making like very little money compared to, and then obviously racing against some people who are paid paid quite well. Uh, so I guess they're just kind of breaking through and getting to that point is the difficulty. Like you have to risk a lot and I guess sacrifice a lot um, and kind of pull your yeah, kind of just fully commit to it and hope that it works out. Yeah. Also, like the physical risk as well, like crashing. Obviously, I'm I'm kind of a wimp, yeah. Um, and yeah, at least I suppose in running, it's I, injuries are still obviously huge, but the the crash risk is yeah puts me off quite a lot as well. Yes, I can un understand that because I'm also scared by that. And it's so crazy how close they are on descent or in the peloton. And you must be really crazy 
to be a bike rider and ride at 80 100 kilometers per hour soon there will be also a british hill climb champs and i think this year it's around a four minute climb for me, me fastest women it's quite short yeah <laughs> i should probably start training <laughs> for like short efforts um yeah previous the last two years have been slightly longer ones still obviously super short but for the uk pretty long uh but yeah i think it's i don't it's a few yes yeah, i think about four minutes um and yeah i'm struggling to find motivation for it but yeah i should probably i should probably be more positive <laughs> and start i'll probably do a few events before then um but yeah it's actually end of october so not too far away um yeah as you I'm can tell surprised. i'm not thrilled <laughs> I'm always surprised just how short the efforts are in the UK climbing champs. Like last year was like supposedly a long one. It was like seven minutes, I think, or eight minutes. So like there must be some longer climbs in the country. <laughs> I don't know. I think the longest climb is literally, it's like 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, yeah. crazy. But yeah, the, the British hill climb scene is pretty interesting. Like, you get a lot of like focus on bikes and um, how light people can get their bikes and things like that. Uh, and also the weather's always absolutely terrible that time of year, so yeah, I'll probably be driving across the country to ride for a few minutes in the rain. Uh, so, yeah. It's still it's still something like as the weather gets worse there's you know, not much going on, so it's a good way to finish off the year before it it's like back to the trainer. Yeah, I just I just use my factor O two uh I do have some lighter wheels because usually I just ride on Fulcrum Racing Zeros, um, like when I'm doing like regular efforts. But yeah, I don't do anything too crazy. Like some people chop off their handlebars and strip off of everything. But it's still quite a light bike. Yeah. It's usually fun to see those videos where there are like four or five kilograms. You wouldn't want to descend on that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I'm thinking uh, you're so much better than anyone else, probably from amateurs, and you should maybe easily win this year. I don't know. I could have. I did nationals for the first time in I think it was three years ago, and it was another short climb, and I just had like an absolutely terrible ride. Uh, I don't know what happened. I think I just got too nervous and like started too hard, so I just like. I could see myself doing the same thing and having an absolutely terrible ride. I guess, yeah, when there's like a, if it's a longer climb, it feels like you can kind of, there's more room for error, like you don't have to be like on top of it from the gun. Um, but yeah, with a short climb, sometimes you can get carried away with like adrenaline and just blow up after a minute. So I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Because I saw Ed is aiming this year for three minutes, nine watts per kilo. Okay, it's probably not impossible, but at least he's aiming for that. It will be interesting to see what the best amateurs can do, like Ed or Andrew Feather, who can push also great watts. It's pretty crazy. Some like non-climbers can do quite well at British hill climbs. I think, yeah, there's like there's a few like sprinters almost that can, <laughs> if it's like a one-minute climb, they just smash up at like a thousand watts. It's insane. But, yeah, that's why I wish like mountain races were a thing. Um, in over in Europe, that'd be cool if there were more events. Because I think occasionally they have a few races up like Stelvio and other mountains, but it's not. It's pretty hard to find out information about them. Um, but yeah, that'd be the, the dream. Yes, I think you might be also improving your watts every year because you start training in twenty sixteen. So you might have a big room to improve yet? Yeah, at some point, I guess I'll stop <laughs> stop improving. Uh, but yeah, since I started kind of focusing on climbing more a few years ago, I've kind of not had to train for other stuff, I guess. Um, although I think that it does come with it, like getting faster on climbs does, like as a cyclist overall, you're obviously better. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think my like improvements definitely leveling off now <laughs> but uh i'll keep trying maybe there might be some reactions from men cyclists when you're passing them 
because some night might be not used to that. Yeah, sometimes pe- people think I'm a boy. <laughs> like a... <laughs> yeah. Maybe yeah. you can talk about your favorite climbs or favorite training locations. Where do you enjoy riding a bike? Uh, ooh, I sp- I've been lucky to spend quite a lot of time in Nice area because my mother lives, uh, works over there. Um, so I've been able to spend quite a bit of time over there. And obviously loads of pros live around that area, so it's pretty great. Um, most of my trainings in Wales, which is, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. I mean, there is, like, most of the climbs don't look very hard on paper, but they're quite, there's a lot of just, like, constant steep, pretty tough pitches um, that makes pretty hard training. But, yeah, I obviously prefer to be in the mountains, uh, like the outdoors area. I've spent a bit of time there, like, over the summer I went for 12 days. Um, and I'd love to go back to, like, the Dolomites because I didn't realize just, like, there's so many climbs still yet to do. Um, but not sure when I'll be able to get back over there. We also found your YouTube channel. I think when I should watch the Abduez video. Yeah. Very embarrassing. <laughs> uh, no, I just watched the Abduez, the, the like 12 day trip video. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, w- it was interesting to see. Like, I also don't know, like, some of the climbs even had like gravel at the top. So, yeah, real interesting uh, to see the approach. Maybe there'll be a Dolmites one coming. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. Also, I saw that you are training around the 600 hours uh, per year on Strava. Oh, I don't actually know, to be honest. <laughs> when I was road racing, I think I was doing a lot more hours. But basically, now, during the week, I ride like an hour every day, basically. Uh, and then, yeah, longer in the weekend if I can. Uh, but most of it's... I basically just try and ride up hills as much as I can. So it's all, yeah, pretty hard riding. Uh, but that's what I enjoy, so probably the opposite of what most coaches would recommend. It's like hard every day, but yeah. yeah. What I wonder, do you also focus on the nutrition in daily life or do you not really focus on that? Um, I mean, I just try and eat normally. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I don't do anything. I don't like obsess over it or count calories and things. Um, and also in terms of like fueling while cycling i definitely i need to do a better job of that because most of my rides are so short that i usually don't have to like think about it if i'm just riding for an hour um but yeah longer rides and stuff i always have to remind myself to yeah, eat and drink enough but, yeah. right i do often wonder about because i know that like on pro teams they take everything to next level like marginal gains and things i yeah, I'm always curious about how much of a difference that makes because, yeah, I definitely <laughs> don't do don't do that. But... It's hard to say, to be honest. Yeah. I'm looking at your road race results, and there's a time trial in Cyprus in 2018, and you finished there only tenth behind Olga Zavolinskaya, almost through minutes and 30 seconds behind. You must have been not in the greatest shape there compared to this year yeah that was i wasn't i didn't do very well when i was road racing uh i was also i was always just like terrible in the bunch and everything and yeah it was like kind of when i started racing less that i started getting a lot fitter as well um but yeah i did yeah i can't say i really miss it but every now and then i do yeah kind of wonder about it yeah also, it's interesting to see that your first race on pro cycling stats is in USA. Yeah, that was, I think that was right after I started road racing. So I grew up in California. Um, and then I'm from yeah the UK originally and then moved there for 10 years. And then when I finished school, came back to the UK. Uh, so I started cycling when I was over there, which was, yeah, completely different to like the UK and Europe scene, uh, but quite a good way of getting into it. There's lots of kind of small local races. Um, and actually, yeah, like they had some stage races with actually like pretty reasonable climbing days. Um, but back then I was didn't know what I was doing and I was terrible. So yeah, I didn't really enjoy them, but yeah. I think your best result might be in Czech Republic race in 2018 where you finished fifth from a winning breakaway. 
where first six riders were basically much faster than the next riders by four or five minutes. Uh, yeah, we got into like a breakaway in the last day. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah, I just never really got the hang of ra riding in a bunch. So there are a few opportunities and like breakaways and things where I did okay, but. Most most of the time I was hanging 10 feet off the back of the belt on. So you were quite well performing in 2018 in that race. It was in 2018 and you started riding in 2016. So in two years you reached already a good level. I see that you also finished 20th in the British uh, Championships road race in 2021. It's probably also quite hard for you to race in uh, Br Britain where there are no big mountains. Most races are just quite lumpy so it's difficult to really get away um, on any of the climbs so they end up being e either just like attritional races or bunch sprints. Um, there's like a national series in the UK which is like uh, maybe six races, five big races throughout the year which attracted all like the top teams. Um, but yeah most of them, there are a few reasonable courses but racing in the UK is yeah, it's quite difficult to kind of use your fitness as if you're a climber to like use that to your benefit and get away. Um, but yeah, it's not, the race seems kind of, I think there's been like less and less races as well over the years and lots of riders have been going to Europe to race. Um, so while it's still competitive, it's, yeah, it's with a lot of riders going abroad to race, it's kind of difficult to make that jump from the UK to European teams, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, the UK must be one of the worst European countries probably for climbing. <laughs> yeah, like, it's just compared to rolling. like Spain, Italy, France, Portugal, even Germany. Like, there's always everywhere there are big climbs, but in the UK, it's yeah. not, so not maybe, the terrain. I guess even like Belgium has bigger climbs, probably. <laughs> we were also well cutting what's and I think the difference between the 60 kilogram rider and 45 kilogram rider uh, was that. The 45 kilogram rider needs to push 0 0.3 watts per kilo more to reach the same speed on the climb, not ways. Yeah, yeah, basically the heavier riders have to push less watts per kilogram on the same climb to get the same speed because uh, the bike is a lower percentage of the total weight uh, and also because of CDA differences. Like, but yeah, it makes quite a big difference, of course, if you compare like uh, below, like once you get below 60 kilometers, like it's exponentially more you, the lower you weight you get. So yeah, yeah, that's it's kind of not ideal for the lightest climbers. <laughs> yeah, at uh, what gradient does that like start to bounce? Well, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it's yeah. like the it it's it exists at every gradient, I think. But like it gets like the higher the gradient, it gets like the difference gets smaller. Let's say. Yeah. So, uh, it's, Low, high grains are of course better for the lighter climbers still but yeah it's still a disadvantage yeah it's quite interesting because yeah Alpdoez is obviously like most people think it's reasonably steep already so yeah but yeah you said that you don't pay that much attention to nutrition but I think you might be one of the leanest uh, women's uh, cyclists I have ever seen yeah I think I'd probably climb best if I was a bit heavier probably I definitely mm -hmm. yeah wouldn't I think I'd start losing power if I was uh, any lighter, yeah. Maybe what's your optimal weight? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's something that the pro teams figure out <laughs> scientifically, but probably like high 40s, maybe. I don't, I'm just making that up based on kind of guessing. Yeah, I mean, I imagine like, yeah, the top athletes must monitor this stuff quite a lot but yeah i kind of try to avoid weighing myself and stuff just yeah. you need to be fueled to be able to perform though at the end of the day maybe the final question what are your goals for the next season or the career overall what you want to achieve in the cycling maybe yeah it's, it's like going back to european hill climb champs i just wish that mountain climbing was <laughs> more of a discipline i was hoping having that race would kind of set off something like maybe as it would encourage more events to start appearing but now that that's not happening um it looks like it'll be kind of hard to get that rolling um 
So yeah, that's kind of like the problem I have at the moment is that I, I like kind of going around and like pushing myself, finding my limits up climbs, but yeah. It'd be nice to have some competitive way of continuing to do that rather than just going on holidays <laughs> and finding segments. Um, that, yeah, I need to, if you have any ideas of uh, <laughs> things, feel free to let me know. Next year, I will do a UCI Riders Agents test. I'm already preparing for that, but I think they're like 100% must, 100 must be someone, some team who might offer even a bigger salary than minimum and give you a chance because of your climbing performances. You're practically with fresh legs, second best climber in the world at least. Maybe in the UE Tour, you might even win on Jebel Hafid, where do you need only... <laughs> ride easily on all the sprint stages and not drop out of the telf telf peloton if there are no at least crosswinds. I see. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine anyone actually wanting to uh, do that. But... I mean, I think uh, Lante Rouge worked with us and he's also like at the Visma team. Like, he, I, th I, th I think he said he ought already asked you a few times if you are interested in riding pro. So I think there, there would be some interest for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it does maybe. a nice race that just uh went straight up a mountain yeah I'll be but, all in. <laughs> yeah but those races as you said they are very rare i think like yeah. i haven't seen even anything close to the uh european climbing champs except some like national ones but yeah yeah there are no general races like that uh or no official ones at least there are some grand fondos i saw the yeah grand there fondos. was a big grand fondo but yeah other than that not really yeah. Thanks for listening and uh, hopefully you will fulfill your potential because you are a great climber. Thanks very much. <laughs>